Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Nostalgia Trap Podcast. I am your host, David Parsons. I am very excited to bring you another show today. Uh, And I want to give a special hello, shout out, welcome uh, to the new listeners to the show, the people who are just listening to this for for the first time, maybe because you perhaps found it uh, on the Baffler's website at thebaffler.com. You know, if you're a fan of the Baffler, I think you'll be a fan of the Nostalgia Trap. I think we've got very, very similar sensibilities, and I think it's a good partnership. But I wanted to give uh, those listeners that have perhaps not heard the show before some idea of what we're doing here. So like I said, my name is David Parsons. I'm a historian. I started this show when I was finishing my uh, graduate degree in U.S. history at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And I kind of started the show, this was in like 2014, because I wanted to interview professors that I had um, that I had been lucky enough to train under at the CUNY Graduate Center, and then other professors that I knew, and then I, it kind of expanded, and the show became you know an opportunity to talk to people that write about history and politics. That's mostly what 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 we do here. It's mostly from a a, a left wing perspective, but of course that that in, engenders a pretty wide variety of political ideas and attitudes. But either way, I like to talk to people who write about history, that write about politics, whether they be in the academy or not. And when I talk to them, I I like to hear basically three things. I want to hear their personal stories. I want to talk about their lives, their memories, the things that shaped them when they were young, who the big teachers and professors were for them, or maybe bosses at work, or people that they knew, who were their big inspirations. I want to hear those stories. I also want to hear about their work, their education, kind of where they went to school, why they ended up studying the things they study, and specifically, what do they study? Is it about the Civil War? Is it about the 1960s and the Vietnam War? There's a lot of that in this show because that's what I come from. I wrote a book called Dangerous Grounds. It's about the uh, anti-war coffee houses that were springing up all around military bases in the United States during the Vietnam War. So that's my primary concern. So you hear a lot of stuff about the 60s and 70s on this show and my own memories of the 80s and 90s and that politics. So I like to hear about the, 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 the work that people do. And then I like to hear their connection and their their perspectives on on politics today. I mean, I in part started the show because I want to understand the kind of larger historical and political trends that are creating the nightmare that we're living through. And, you know, I, I started I kind of tuned into the nightmare myself personally, you know, probably in the 90s around 9-11 when I was, when I was coming of age. And then and, and, and things have just gotten worse from there. So in a lot of ways, this podcast is about kind of using the the thinkers of our culture wherever they are writing about history and politics to, to help us understand our, our our era and how we as as human beings as Americans as whatever uh, how we survive it how we navigate it and I think that you know the the tools of history and the tools of uh, of, of research and writing and thinking deeply about these issues are are things that we can we can hopefully bring out on the show. So that's my goal with the nostalgia trap is to talk to smart people, figure out where we are and what we can do about it. Um, because you know, if you haven't noticed, the left has been losing for a long time. I want it to win, and I want to figure out the most effective ways that that happens. So that's through these conversations, and you know the the the, the podcast mixes the politics with the personal. We like to talk about where people come from uh, and why they uh, became the people that they became and and what their their kind of prescriptions for moving forward are. So today's episode is very much in the in that vein. Today's episode is is actually with a friend of mine, um, someone who went to I went to school with. His name is Carl Linskoog. He is currently a professor of history at Raritan Valley Community College in central New Jersey, and he has something to say about what that population is like. But Carl is 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 someone who I, I met in graduate school my first year. I tell a story on this in this conversation of like kind of what that was like and how he, uh, meeting him kind of blew my mind and definitely pushed my politics into places they'd never been before. Uh, but Carl is now someone who writes about immigration. And I wanted to talk to him today because he has a recent piece in the Washington Post about the recent history of immigration in Haiti. His primary lens is through Haiti and how um, the treatment of Haitian immigrants and refugees seeking asylum has provided uh, a model for the U.S. government. It's really the the kind of experience of Haitians that was the, the, the first major kind of uh, moment 
by which the U.S. government started building the awful immigration detention system that we have today. And so Carl Linskoog has this great book that's coming out very soon called Detain and Punish, Haitian Refugees and the Rise of the World's Largest Immigration Detention System. So it's been really awesome to watch Carl develop from you know us in graduate school to him being this um, expert on the history of migration, in particular Haitian migration, and how that has impacted what is going on today with children being separated and Trump's like really, really really gross acceleration of these policies. So it's great to go back in time with Carl and talk a little bit about graduate school and his background and where he where he's from and how he became uh, the person to talk to you about migration, or at least one of the people to talk to you about the history of migration. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. And you know, the other element of, of the nostalgia trap that I wanted to, to add for Baffler listeners, listeners is that I, me and my producer, Peter Sabatino, who's another good friend who I've enlisted and make him edit the show. Um, you know, we don't get paid much for this. In fact, we don't get paid at all. We have one of those things called a Patreon, which allows people who listen to the show and enjoy the show to support us. We put out bonus material and bonus episodes to try to lure people to support us. But really, we are a two man operation that's doing this because we really believe in it. And we really believe that these voices and these conversations are important. So if you believe that too, you can support the show and it would be really, really helpful to us and keep the show alive. So you can do that. All of it is at nostalgiatrap.com. Click on the bonus episodes and you can subscribe or you can go to patreon.com slash nostalgiatrap. Subscribe for any amount of uh, money to give me a dollar a month, five dollars a month. It doesn't matter. Um, You'll get the bonus material and you will support a show that you like, hopefully, and that is useful and enjoyable. And that's what it's all about. So Thanks so much for the people that are supporting the show. It's it's helping keep us going. Uh, but again, if you wanna if you wanna add your two cents, literally, um, please do. Any amount would help. It's Patreon.com/slash Nostalgia Trap to keep the independent left media on the air uh, and and keep history alive in our public discourse because we need a lot more uh, historical knowledge if we want to move forward. I think that the left and the right, you know, obviously um, could use a lot more knowledge of history and you know I'm, I'm on the left team so i want us to kind of learn from our recent and more maybe more distant past and figure out how to beat uh the, the really dark forces that are circling around us right now so with that in mind i hope you enjoy this conversation with carl linskoog I, I can can't really speak i can't really overstate my appreciation for carl's work and his whole attitude that he brings to the historical project so i hope you enjoy this conversation and more nostalgia trap stuff at nostalgia trap Dot com. Thanks to The Baffler for hosting the show. Thanks for listening. Enjoy this. This is me talking with Professor Carl Linskoog. Carl, I'm not going to pretend like I don't know you uh, and, I, and, that I, and that I don't know a little bit of uh, who you are. But, you know, lately I feel like um, your stuff is taking on a certain kind of resonance because of um, the Trump administration's acceleration of um, a really awful Im- immigration policies that have been around for a long time. I know that you've been concerned about and writing about for a while. But does it feel weird to you now, um, having st- been a person that's been studying immigration, and Amer- particularly American immigration policy for a while, is it weird to watch like the the subject become such a dominant part of discourse right now? It's a, it, it, because I, I, I mentioned that because you have an article in the Washington Post right now. Uh, it came out a couple of days ago. Um, that's about the that's about the. M- immigration crisis but specifically about Haiti but either way it must be kind of strange to to see your 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 kind of like main topic become such a, a huge topic for everybody else yeah well um i'd say distressing is a yeah. more sort of accurate way to put it because of course um it means that uh that the it's it's relevant because the problem that i ex- examined historically um is is such a current thing. I did a talk at the grad center a few months ago, our, our shared alma mater. And, um, and I said, I wish this wasn't such a, such a hot and relevant topic, but it is because of the Trump administration's policies, of course, as you mentioned. So, I mean, I'm glad to have something to add to the discussion, especially because the historical piece is often missing from commentary and analysis, but, um, I'd be just as happy if, if my work weren't so relevant, because that means we wouldn't have 
this current problem in the shape and form that it is. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of bittersweet that uh that that you're 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 the expert of the moment because it's such a terrible situation that's happening unfolding in front of us right now. I mean, um, when you were at, talking at the graduate center, what was your talk about? I mean, I know that I know that your your primary lens into immigration, and, and we can talk about it because um, I want to talk about your book. But like your primary lens is through Haiti. But is that is that what your talk mm-hmm. at the graduate center was about? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was just a talk based on my forthcoming book, um, and um, yeah, it was about the history of immigration detention and about how it all when when uh, the policy of immigration detention was reinstituted in 1981. It was Haitians that it was designed for and that it applied exclusively to. That's something that a lot of people, even who might know a lot about the immigration detention system today. They might not know that. They might not know about its origins after it was reinstituted in 1981. So it was about that, and it was about how the system has changed and evolved and developed and mm. how people have struggled against it and resisted um, in the 1970s through the present, basically. Um, and then looking again at the at the experience of Haitians primarily and the key role that they played in all of that history. What happened in 1981 that um, Haitians became a target of immigration policy? Well, they would they were already targeted by the mid 1970s, uh, and that's when uh, migration patterns from Haiti start to shift, uh, and when the so-called Haitian boat people really start to come in large numbers. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't yet in such a national thing. Um, but the the administrations of the 1970s were already laying the groundwork for what became the policy of immigration detention because they wanted to stop these scores and huge numbers of Haitian boat people for, from coming to the shores of Florida. Um, but then what really happens is um, two things. It's the Caribbean refugee crisis of 1980 that brings more than 100,000 Cubans and tens of thousands of Haitians in 1980. And that's really the first time that the United States is in the position of being a country of mass first asylum. Mm. And our and our immigration system was not prepared for that. And our American officials, did not, nothing was in place to deal with the kind of numbers of asylum seekers showing up on American doors, mm. doorstep. Yeah. And, um, and then to add to that, you know, they're coming from, uh, well, the Cuban thing is a little more complicated, but for Haitians, they're poor, they're foreign, they're black, and there's this huge racial backlash at a time of national racial backlash and resistance to the civil rights already happening. So it's this sort of like toxic stew that just lays the groundwork for this intense backlash against immigration and asylum seekers and refugees in general. Um, and the other thing that happens is the Carter administration does some things to respond to that, but of course Reagan's elected in 1980, and um, Reagan is is really the one that, um, building upon some of the things that had already been established by previous administrations, the Reagan administration decides it's going to reinstitute um, immigration detention, and then, as I said at first, it applies exclusively to Haitians, and then one year later, after the Haitians, through legal resistance, basically block the policy of immigration detention, the Reagan administration says, okay, so we're going to get around this by saying it's not discriminatory, it's not just for Haitians, we're going to apply it to all aliens trying to enter the country, and that's when it becomes a, a policy that is applied to all, and now it's this behemoth that is the largest immigration detention system in the world, and the pattern for you know, global immigration detention systems that all sort of got going again in 1981 and in 1982. That is crazy. So um, your your book is called Detain and Punish, uh, Haitian Refugees and the Rise of the World's Largest Immigration Detention System. And that title, I mean, first of all, I love the uh, um, the Foucault <laughs> kind of reference in the, right. t- in the title. But the yeah. the kind of uh, the, the subtitle about the largest, the world's largest immigration detention system. When you say that, are you talking about a specific element of the American system or the American system itself? Like what well, is what is um, what is the world's largest immigration detention system? The that's the imi- the detention the system that detains immigrants or people for immigration related violations in the United States. Okay. The United States yeah. has the world's largest immigration detention. System. Right, right. There are a lot of other countries and now like almost every nation or many many nations around the world have developed immigration detention systems and they're based on you know the United States in many ways. Um, but the United States um, 
incarcerates or imprisons more people by far than any other nation in the world for immigration-related violations. Mm. And so much so that, um, you know, you, to understand the carceral state and this sort of growing understanding of uh, what they call carceral studies, you just had Heather Thompson on talking about this, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you have to also include the immigration detention piece because now immigrant detainees or people related it, detained for immigration-related violations have sur- surpassed the number of people in prison for drug-related offenses. Mm, mm-hmm. So historians like Tori Hester have said, well, like immigrants or immigration-related violations and then drug-related detention and incarceration are the two sort of cornerstones of the carceral state now. Wow. Um, and that's that's frightening and yeah. important to understand, and especially if we want to try to solve this crisis, we have to include the immigration um, piece in it as well. I think that's a really important piece of it. Like the, I mean, I, I taught a class on mass incarceration um, uh, last year where we read Angela Davis and we t- and we thought about you know prison abolition, and so much of that literature is about the war on drugs. Which is mm-hmm. which is important, exactly. obviously, and it's something that you and I mm-hmm. have talked about for years. The war on drugs being like the central lens for people who are concerned about the carceral state to kind of talk about. But I, yeah, I, that's it's something that I think is becoming more and more clear that that carceral state is got uh, is uh, you know the immigration detention system is a is a massive part of it. And now you know it seems like a a right place for activists to talk about too. So yeah, yeah exactly, and. Um it's gratifying and hopeful to see the activists working on the sort of drug-related incarceration stuff and the immigration-related stuff coming together, and in some ways they're being driven together in in solidarity by the Trump administration. And of course, in policy, those two areas of punitive responses to either crossing borders or using or possessing possessing illegal drugs, they they merge in policy. Totally, yeah. Yeah. So it's not like oh, just, you know, one has developed here and one has developed there, and now they're part of this system. Like, they interact, and there's a lot of interchange, and, you know, you might get arrested for drug possession or doing something drug-related, and you might serve that time, but then because of your, you know, status, then you might be continue to be detained or detained before deported for your immigration status. So it's Mm. like it goes, you know, it merges and flows back and forth, and it's part of this enormous problem that we have. And and it also, I would say, the discourse, I mean, apart from just, you know, the policy stuff of the war on drugs being the big kind of umbrella that's that's uh, that's in our history, but but it also, you know, it courses through the, the way the right um, and the right wing talks about, um, and even, the, even, I would say, liberals, the way they talk about um, immigrants, ha, uh, you know, it has to do with the drug war and the war on drugs. And, you know, the, the example, what we're talking about now, about like the, the Donald Trump administration is so hostile and so belligerent um, in kind of creating a hysteria or wanting to create hysterias about like things like MS-13 and drug gangs. Right. And, you know, they just do this this really like disgusting displays about like angel families and families that have been um, who's had lost loved ones to violence from immigrants and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about the kind of hysteria that was thrown on Haitian people and what people were saying about Haitians during the 80s? Because that's something that like. I went to a I went to a talk at the Graduate Center years ago that was about that, um, and it kind of shocked me. Like I didn't really know the kinds of things that um, people were saying about Haitian immigrants and how the Reagan administration um, kind of accelerated that. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think just to your first point, I think you're totally right that um, today, like in the 1980s and 1990s, um, the sort of targeting of undocumented people or unauthorized migrants and then, um, you know, drug users or drug related folks, um, that, that does go back and forth. Right. And they are sort of demonized similarly because they're both sort of like indefensible in the eyes of their critics. Right. Like if you use drugs, if you're involved in drugs, then like you don't have any rights or you shouldn't, and you should be thrown in jail. And then, you know, if you're here illegally, what, what is there to talk about? Right. You you come here illegally. And so like the sort of two indefensible, Hold on one second. Two of the, indi- from the right at least, uh, indefensible violations of yeah. American sovereignty right. and law and stuff like that. And that's that's definitely the sort of rhetoric and the emotions that uh, the Trump administration is playing on and drawing upon the history of. Um, so in the 1980s and 1990s, um, yeah, Haitians were 
seen as um, dangerous because they were flooding our borders. They were seen as particularly um, foreign, right? Mm -hmm. They're black, so this is part of what prompts this really racist backlash. And because they were the boat people, unlike at earlier waves of Haitian migrants, were some of the least educated, some of the poorest people coming, which is why they came by boat and risked their lives, sometimes lost their lives trying to get here. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have what some people would want to have, you know, the skills or the sort of cultural capital to negotiate American society as well, which makes them seem even more foreign or less valuable. And then for Haitians, a long thing that's just been recurring and been immensely damaging for their community has been the association with disease. So in the 1970s, there was a huge tuberculosis scare in Florida, and the idea was, well, Haitians are the princi principally responsible for this, and, you know, there's a, there's a long history of associating immigrants with disease and that yep. sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, Trump uh, used the, the word Trump infested. Trump used the word infested, and, yeah. Uh, I just wondered. Right. If, yeah, and, and that's just, you know, one example, but but was it, it was, I th when I think of Haitians in the 80s and the kind of, like, uh, national discourse, I feel like they were associated with the AIDS crisis a lot, right? Well, that's the, that's the next thing. So after tuberculosis, it's AIDS. Yeah. And the centers, it's because um, the Center for Disease Control listed them as one of five groups that was particularly likely to be carrying this disease before they knew what caused it or what its origins were. Um, and the only national group that was singled out to be really the cause, they would, they, people assumed then, as um, for, of the AIDS crisis and this terrifying disease. And so, um, you know, you can only imagine what kind of damage that did oh, to yeah. the community and to their national image on top of already the racism and the nativism and the xenophobia and this idea going back really to like the founding of the Haitian Republic that Haiti's dangerous, they're so different, they're sort of irredeemably, you know, like outside of our un understanding in terms of their culture and in Latin America and like all sorts of things. So this is a long, long history of um, exclusion and be putting them outside and then add these sort of disease-related things on top of that, and the fact that they're coming here and they're um, not welcome as refugees, and they're excluded by the State Department and immigration because of mostly of geopolitics and stuff like that. So it's it's a pretty difficult situation for for unauthorized Haitian migrants or refugees or asylum seekers. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it's hard to miss the racism, too, with Haiti being like the world's first black republic and like the antagonism that that engenders from the U.S. government. Yeah, definitely. And for a long time, so obviously Haitians and their advocates and people observing for a long time were aware that like racism is really driving a lot of this. Mm. And for me, like I... I could see that in the historical record and like thinking about it historically. And I was persuaded that that was the case, but it was sometimes hard to pin down exactly like where that is. Cause historians want to be like, okay, so what's the evidence of that? You know, you can't just have a feeling you want to say like, look, here's evidence that racism was driving this policy. And for me, the most persuasive way that that happened beyond just the sort of general, like, you know, racist portrayal in the media or just like your everyday person, reacting in a racist way mm -hmm. um, was the fact that the local officials, local and state officials in, in Florida and South Florida had a huge influence, especially in the early years of the arrival of Haitian boat people to set up a policy of exclusion and detention. Um, and that was coming from a racist space because their constituents and maybe they themselves didn't want to see a bunch of poor black people. So they put pressure on Washington and all the people making policy to keep Haitians out. And so I think they're sort of on the ground in South Florida. Um, that's mm, really where yeah. the racism against Haitians was operative. And then, of course, it's influencing like the Reagan and the you know the subsequent administrations. But you know, it's not doesn't appear in the documents exactly. You know what I mean? Right, but, right. Um, but you can, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, I mean, the, the good historian um, can can kind of paint that picture without, you know. I mean, it's it's hard. It's it's, it's really hard to portray that stuff. It's uh, to me like when I'm reading like. I don't know. You, you you mentioned Heather Ann Thompson's work. Like, 
you know, it, it, it's it's hard. You don't need necessarily just like blatant racist statements from people to see like that the policy and the phenomena and the and the the kind of underlying um, I don't know um, impulses that are driving these policies are have have a lot to do with with racism. It's like something that right. seems kind of obvious after a while. I, I wondered if right. you could like. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the '90s, because the '90s in Haiti were, to me, that's when I, the Haiti story became like a, a story that caught my attention was during the the the, the Bill Clinton administration, and and something happened with the um, with refugees during that administration that I think is very kind of telling. And I was reading, you know, reading your Washington Post article again. It, um, your Washington Post article is called "Mistreating Refugee Children Is Sadly All Too American," and it kind of traces. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I think it's a great article for giving like an idea of. Um, how this policy is um, is connected to to stuff that happened in the 80s and 90s, but specifically the Clinton administration. What did they? How did they respond to the the refugee crisis that happened in um, coming from Haiti in, in the 90s? Yeah. So taking one step back to sort of set the stage for Clinton's role in the Clinton administration. Um, so there's a there's a democratic election that produces this left wing um, populist as president of Haiti in in, um, the early 1990s, and soon thereafter there's a a military coup that deposes him and forces him to leave the country and just unleashes this massive wave of repression against his supporters and the whole popular movement that allowed Aristide to to become president of Haiti. Mm -hmm. So that generates this gigantic um, refugee crisis. Huge numbers of Haitians are leaving the country, not all coming to the United States, but many seeking, you know, asylum and refuge here. Um, and the Bush administration, despite the fact that it condemns the coup and it says, you know, we want the restoration of democracy and stuff, doesn't want the Haitians. And they they try to keep them out in various ways. First, they, they, they just um, keep them on these um, Coast Guard cutters, but then they're soon overwhelmed, and so then they open up Guantanamo as a refugee processing center. Mm. That's the first time people are detained at Guantanamo. Haitians are the first Guantanamo detainees far before the post-9-11 detention policies and things like that. Yeah, that definitely um, caught my attention, is that Guantanamo is uh, is, is opened up and, and, and used in this way and it, well before Guantanamo becomes synonymous with kind of like the war on terror and all that. Exactly, exactly. Um and so, and to get to the, so, um, and then there's a bunch of legal resistance and there's, there's resistance by the refugees inside Guantanamo to try to become free and to be allowed to enter the United States. Um, Clinton, when he's running for president, you know, really criticizes, um, George W, George H. W. Bush for his policy towards Haitians. He calls it cruel. He says he would open up America's doors to these poor refugees and stuff like that. But once he's elected, he does an about face and he says, and I think that's largely because of the power of nativism. And he calculates that he would have made paid this large political price for allowing all these poor black refugees in. So then he basically adopts the same position that the Bush administration adopts, which is wow. we're not going to let these people in. Um, and they, they claim to be doing that for humanitarian reasons. They say, well, if we if we do let them in, just many more people are going to come because they think the door is open and that's going to risk their lives. So it's actually for their own good, mm. despite the fact that they're being, you know, murdered and brutalized in the country where they're being returned to or being forced to stay. Um there's a, and you know, by that time, there's a huge movement on by the Haitian refugees themselves, some of them in detention, some of them in this country, uh, and many of their supporters. And basically, um, they put enough pressure on the Clinton administration to finally force some some to be let in, and the, and finally to force the Clinton administration to close Guantanamo. Um, but then the thing I talk about in this recent post piece is they re even after the crisis in Haiti is resolved and the Aristide presidency is restored, um, they reopened Guantanamo because in late 1994, many Cubans and Haitians once again sail for American shores. Clinton still doesn't want lots of Haitians here. That hasn't changed. In fact, it was part of what drove his decision to send the U.S. military to invade Haiti and restore Aristide was hoping he would solve the Haitian refugee crisis. Wow. Um, it doesn't happen. And since we're now talking about the detention of children, I thought it was useful to share this history of 
these several hundred Haitian children, unaccompanied Haitian children, that end up in Guantanamo. Clinton doesn't want to admit them. They had the power to do so. There's this thing called the um, the ability to parole. The, rec- the attorney general can parole any alien into the country. Um, and so people are saying, you should do that. You know, use the parole authority to let these kids in. Most of the parents have been murdered by the military, paramilitary in Haiti. They're children, for God's sake, yeah, and yeah. they're fleeing this horrible situation. Um, the Clinton administration resists. There's large and intense protests by the children themselves, hunger strikes. At one time, they rise up and burn their tents, and they're fighting the guards in Guantanamo. So it's this dramatic confrontation. That is, that's sort of incredible. Take- I mean, to think about how, how you know, we've, we've had, like, I don't know, hearing about hunger strikes by um, people who are being held under the auspices of terrorism at Guantanamo. And hearing about that, and we, we, we have heard about that for many years, but that's a history that I think people don't know as much as that, you know, this idea that there are children rebelling and burning stuff and trying desperately to escape uh, or get better conditions or something, say, you know, save their lives at Guantanamo in the 90s during the Clinton administration is just kind of um, an incredible piece of history. And I think so, so important to think about today. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree. And I and and it makes it I think you're right, especially compelling that it was kids doing this, yeah. you know, and how courageous must that have been. But um you know, in my book, you know, it's about always the two sides of it. It's repression and resistance and the, yeah. um, and the, the way beyond the children, this is an incredible story of resistance because as you say, way before it's like Guantanamo detainees or, or immigrant detainees in the United States doing hunger strikes and resisting and organizing in time, which they're doing right now. And we've been hearing about in the last couple of years, you know, in the 1970s, Haitian women in, you know, West in a prison in West Virginia have this hunger strike, and they're just like doing their thing. And so, there's this is a big part of the um, the movement for refugee and immigrant rights that's been going on a long time. Mm. They sort of like preceded or set the tone historically for a lot of the current resistance movement. Yeah, and this is where I see the Haitian story as connected to things like. Heather and Thompson and other people who are documenting prisoner resistance and resistance inside because just as, a lot, you know, incarcerated people have always fought for their freedom, so have incarcerated people who are immigrants and migrants, stuff like that, and that needs to be part of the story, too. Yeah. Um, and in, in, in terms of resistance, I mean, I think a lot of people are thinking today, and, you know, you're seeing, a, if there's one thing that's kind of heartening is seeing how outraged so many people in the American population are about this story, and part of it is because they didn't know the story, and there's just, it, it, you know... One like kind of macabre favor that Trump is doing for us is like making all of this so blatant and so ugly that, um, you know, people who are otherwise not really uh, politically engaged or active, you know, quote unquote, ordinary Americans are becoming outraged and want to do something. But I think there's a lot of confusion about what to do. You know, people are like, how do we how do we confront this? You know, and, and, and I think that's another place where we have to look to history besides the people that are that are kind of in these spaces, the migrants themselves, the, the people who are, you know, prisoners, essentially, um, rebelling mm-hmm. themselves. And like you're talking about, like in Guantanamo or wherever that might be, what are the kind of things, what were the what were the most effective things that were happening outside of the prisons to like, you talk, you talked about like putting pressure on the Clinton administration. Who's doing that? Like what groups are, are doing that? And, and what are the, what are some other like, I don't know, effective resistance strategies for, for this kind of this kind of stuff? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I definitely agree with you that it's something, if we know that history, it has important lessons and guidelines for how we can do that effectively today. Um, so there, so the sort of leaders of this and the people who are doing it longer were just the Haitian exile community or the Haitian community in the United States that was from the sort of beginning and even before the, the, the refugee crisis began. They had this network of people based mostly in New York and then following in South Florida and Boston and elsewhere of just sort of transnational activism and resistance. And they were the ones keeping everyone attuned to what's happening in Haiti and what's going on and trying to put pressure on the Mm -hmm. U S government. Um, but especially in the 1990s and before, but especially when the coup happens in the coup years of the 1990s, there's a lot more people who get involved. Uh, and there are all kinds, you know, civil rights organizations, the congressional black caucus, 
sometimes takes an important leadership role, and allies and activists who are just doing solidarity work. And that becomes really important in terms of the larger political um, calculations that I think are made to either stand with or deny Haitian refugees. Mm. And then, so, but it's always sometimes hard to know exactly what effect that sort of political activism and solidarity work has, even if you can recognize it had to have been an important part of this outcome. I think it's clear that the most effective um, acts of resistance, aside from what the detainees are doing inside, was legal legal action and legal resistance. Yeah. So there's this network of lawyers, and of course, you know, lots of people have pointed out that like law doesn't, and what happens in courtrooms and stuff like that isn't aside from or separate from the other sorts of politics, but the, that legal advocacy and legal solidarity is really a big part of the story I tell in the book, and it's those are the most substantial obstacles that are continually thrown up against the U.S. government's detention efforts. Yeah, the yeah. U.S. government often finds a way to circumvent, and sometimes that means that they actually expand the detention system, which is poses sort of a paradox for activists because... You know, sometimes legal resistance then has these counter, these counter effects that you don't want to see. But it, the law is really the tool that um, yeah, and frees you know the people of Guantanamo and often sometimes stifles the growth of the detention system and that sort of thing. Yeah, and and that's something that I think a lot of um, particularly like I don't know, and I include myself in this, like kind of radicals or people that are like really just want to tear this thing apart. You know, like I want to like yeah. I, I feel like I want to just show up with uh, uh, thousands of people at these detention centers and just rip the walls apart and free the kids. I mean, that just seems like the mm-hmm. impulse that I want to do. But but as I've gotten older, and this is like such a like old older left thing to do, it's just like you start to see like all the different pieces of the puzzle. And like I, you know, you talk about. About like the when Trump instituted the Muslim ban last year, you know, um, or maybe what like a year and a half ago, you saw all these people showing up at the airport, and I was like, this is awesome, you know, all these people, and then I'm like, well, what are they going to do, uh, you know, because they're mm-hmm. all just going to show up, and like that's great, but then um, lawyers were showing up, and like ACLU mm-hmm. lawyers and civil rights attorneys, and they were showing up, and they were offering their services, and they seemed to actually be getting stuff done. Um, and so, like, I was always like, I was like, thank God the lawyers were there, you know, because it seems like there's always an element that has to actually confront the system on that level, too, right? As much as, like, yeah. as much as my impulse yeah. as, like, a human being is just to, like, I just want to destroy this place. But it seems like that's just not something that's in the cards or maybe another, uh, um, give it give it a few more years and we'll get there. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I think that, um, I think you said the thing, the key thing you said there was two, right? So, like, Yes, and, or, you know what I mean? Like, it's going to, and in the the history that I've discovered through this book is, um, you know, there were literally actually people like activists on the grassroots activists in Miami that showed up at the, at the fence or the edge of Chrome Detention Center, this notorious immigrant prison in South Florida. And they did just what you said. They broke in, they tore down the fences and they freed people. Right. right? And sometimes that was like happening at the same time as there was like, these uprisings going on inside Chrome. So that's happening. Yeah. And that sort of constant, like, protest, and sometimes so militant and so strong that, like, they're actually clashing with, like, the, you know, the people literally imprisoning their, you know, their compatriots. But then, um, then at a parallel or something that's interweaved in that is the legal resistance. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was like, and it included people like Michael Ratner and folks from the Center for Constitutional Rights, and actually during and after his experience representing Haitian detainees in Guantanamo, he he wrote about this. And, like, of course, folks like that who are largely against the system or its most brutal effects have, they've done a lot, especially these these lawyers and stuff, people like Ratner did a lot of thinking about, you know, are we supporting the system by going along with it, by working inside of it? How can we use the law? to effectively resist and what's the relationship between the law and what's going on in the streets and inside the facilities. So it's definitely complex, but I think part of the lesson from the history is, yeah, the law can be an effective and a very powerful tool for protecting people and trying to fight for liberation, but, you know, that can't operate independently and that's certainly not sufficient. 
Yeah, you gotta have you gotta have the pressure too. And you're you're right. I think right. Uh, you know I think that people are, are starting to come to that. Is that you know it's a it, it's a matrix of of strategies, um, and we need to be kind of thinking carefully about how we use all this energy because there's you know there is a lot of energy out there. People want to donate to the ACLU. They want to they want to run candidates. I mean, there's a lot of I I feel like there's a lot of energy in wanting to you know even yell at administration officials in restaurants and stuff like that. So it's kind of like well yeah. how do we how do we take all that and shape it into a, a policy that's that's gonna uh, and a set of strategies that's gonna confront this in a meaningful way and and i mean i, I don't want to lose sight of the main main thing is that we just want to help the people that are suffering in this policy um and it seems like they're suffering worse than than ever before but as your history shows out uh, or shows that you know this has been happening for a long time and this is part of right. a, a much wider kind of phenomenon in American history. It's like I want to say to all the Americans that are joining up in, in their outrage right now, like, welcome to the club. Like, let's yeah. let's do this, you know, because we've been we've been screaming about this for a while. Yeah, definitely. And what I would add to that is and another lesson from the history is the importance of maintaining independence, political independence, because if we historians know and people who are sort of historically oriented know that this wasn't a problem, you know, the problem of mass incarceration or brutal immigration system or immigration detention, any of these big problems were not created by a single political party. It was a bipartisan effort. It's it's a systemic thing. And so, uh, and some of the most effective groups and individuals historically to resist, I think, have said, we have our principles and our goals, and no matter what this politician or what this party happens to be doing right now... Um, we need to be independent because we're not trying to be co-opted in, in order for the the next election outcome or this or that. Yeah, and we've seen and we've so, seen. I mean, just in your, the story you've told just now. I mean, we've seen how um, you know liberal political figures like Bill Clinton, who was very much about kind of moving the Democratic Party to the right. You know, they, they they're not allies in this fight. In fact, they're the ones that are that are um, in part responsible for building the ideological and structural kind of basis for what's happening now. So thanks a lot, Democrats. Thanks a lot, liberals. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it's funny, Carl, I wanted to go I, go back in time a little bit because I know this is the nostalgia sure. trap. So I want to hear a little bit about like who you are. But one thing that I wanted to share with everyone is that Carl and I, you know, we were part of the uh, cohort um, together uh, starting at the Graduate Center PhD program in history in 2004. So we were one of uh, just, you know, a few people that – that sat in a room together and started that program, and that the influence that I that you had on me was tremendous. In part because, you know, you were part of the people that had um, master's degrees in history already, and I didn't. I was just like kind of like starting out my education again after um, after undergrad and kind of doing the PhD all at once. So I felt like I had to catch up to you guys, um, and, and like I remember. I remember in class and in our conversations out out of class, right when we started school together, that you, I was always in awe of like how much you you criti criticized liberals and criticized Democrats. Because at the time, I was kind of like, well, the Democrats are you know who we need to be supporting because they're the left, um, and 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 mm -hmm. it, it, in part like your your interventions in class and and outside of class when we would hang out like always drove me to kind of think critically about liberalism uh, as 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 a kind of phenomenon but also the way that liberalism was kind of embedded in the democratic party um all all of that like kind of drove me to kind of think of things more, more seriously and more critically so you know that was that was my history with you um but i i wanted i, I know you're from a you're from you're from what like would you describe your your background as being from like rural area like rural Iowa? Is oh that, yeah, is that where you're from? Definitely. Yeah, I'm from a uh, little small town in northwest Iowa called Orange City. About when I was there, I had about five thousand people were, were in that town. Wow, and what's what are Which the? This isn't as small as they get in Iowa, but it's it's relatively speaking a pretty small place. What are the staple crops out there? Corn and yeah. beans, of course. Those yeah. are the two things you'll see for miles and miles as you're driving along. Did you have any inkling when you were growing up out there that you would um, become a historian? Where, where did, where did, or where did that come from? That impulse to go to school and get a degree and become a professor? Yeah, um, not necessarily a historian, but mo both my parents are um, were college professors. There was mm -hmm. a small liberal arts. Um, Christian college in my hometown mm -hmm. called Northwestern College. They both taught there. My father psychology and my mother English. So, you know, I was I was aware of 
what it might be like to be uh, working in the academy and that sort of thing. So I don't think it's like that strange. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I wasn't a particularly good high school student. I, I had no idea, even in the later years in college, I went to the University of Iowa, that, you know, what I might do. Um, so, yeah, so it's not, it's kind of surprising that I ended up uh, as a historian. Um, what about what yeah. what about politics though? I mean, I, I mentioned just now that you were like I felt like you had such a grasp of like what was happening politically, and I I, I admired your passion so much in in graduate school, and I, and it was a big influence on me. I still think as we get further away from graduate school, I still think about those early years as being so mm. formative. But but I mean, you, where where do politics enter into it? Were your parents political? Or were you uh, were they on the left? How did you kind of come to because for me, the thing I remember the most about you is how much you were into labor history, and like labor was a, yeah. big, a big kind of entryway for you. So when did that happen? Yeah, um, well, I'd say that I was very influenced by you and some of our other classmates and comrades that were part of this great cohort. I thought too. So um, thanks for mentioning that. But, yeah, for um, sure. Um, so I'll speak to the labor history part, and then. Take, take a few steps backwards to talk about the sort of politics or political orientation that preceded that. Um, when I was a senior in college, I went to Washington, D.C., and I worked for this little nonprofit doing great work called the Labor Heritage Foundation. Mm-hmm. Not to be confused with the Heritage Foundation, of course. <laughs> they, this is a group that um, does work t- uh, to support uh, the labor movement through the arts and music and stuff like that. And um, so that's where I got more sort of acquainted with the labor movement. It was also interesting to be in Washington, D.C., like in the months right after 9-11. So that was an interesting political moment. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, after that, and and probably largely because of my um, experience at the Labor Heritage Foundation and learning about the labor movement and going to like labor events and meeting activists and having conversations with Peter Jones was the executive director, and just um, that that was influential in terms of getting me to think more about like working class history and labor history. And then the big thing that pushed me down that road is I decided to do a master's degree at Northern Illinois University, and I studied with Rose Foyer, who's a great labor historian, and uh, Jim Schmidt was the other main person that sort of got me on the labor track. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're both great scholars and they were great mentors and Rose especially, um, she really taught me a lot about labor history and she oversaw my master's thesis, which looked at um, Latino steel workers in Chicago and um, thinking about ethnicity and race and sort of those connections between um, labor and migration and race and ethnicity and radicalism and capitalism and all that sort of stuff. I'd say it really took root when I was at NIU studying with Rose, and then when I went to CUNY, I um, studied with Josh Freeman, who's another you know, well-established and great labor historian, and that allowed me to continue thinking about that sort of stuff. Mm, yeah. um, but in terms of politics, you know, my family, my household wasn't particularly political. The community I grew up in was extremely conservative. Um, you know, I, I remember someone reported that just based on the the voting data and stuff after, I think it was 2000, or I'm not sure, Um, but in the early 2000s, Sioux County, which is the the place where I grew up, was one of the um, most conservative places in the country in terms of voting for Republicans, and it was a particular kind of conservatism. It was, it's a very, very conservative evangelical Christian community that I grew up in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I went to a public school, but you might as well have been a Christian school because there was prayer before sports events and all sorts of things. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that was a, that was sort of my first political response or response to that because um, I just felt it was totally stifling it was an ex- you know exclusive and judgmental community, and the, I felt the sort of little police department in Orange City operated as um, you know a force to just reinforce the status quo, which I didn't like there. Mm-hmm. And so my anti-authoritarian politics were sort of like forged there, I guess you would say. And then I don't know, like I read Howard Zinn and Chomsky in high school, and 
was starting to think about those things. I was paying attention to, though not participating in the anti-globalization movement at the end of high school and the beginning of college and sort of interested in like students against sweatshops and that's their work in the late 90, 1990s. And so I'd say, um, yeah, those were the things that got me more and more turned on to politics and thinking more critically about the system. And then, of course, since we're of the same generation and almost exactly the same place in our academic careers, 9-11 was this huge thing, right? Like I was yeah. trying to understand the world and I was frightened and horrified and outraged by a lot of the changes that happened after 9-11, the Iraq war, um, probably more than anything turned me into an activist and, um, things continued on from there, I guess you would say. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, yeah. The nine 11 moment, I think a, a lot of it, it's, it, it's kind of incredible how much time has gone by. <laughs> like that's another thing about like getting older is being like, was nine yeah. 11, like five years ago. Um, right. no. And, and like, that's the kind of the, I think maybe if we can offer anything to younger people, it's like kind of the perspective of like what it was like to go through something like that momentous, because I think there are a lot of people who are actually succumbing to the Trump shock effect a little bit, you know, they're, kind of like Mm. it's shocking it is shocking that like what he's doing and what his attitudes are but at the same time if you've read like Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky this seems like right out of the playbook right yeah definitely and that's of course we historians observe like that's where having a long or a longer historical memory is useful right like it's it's good to have that outrage and that impulse to action if you're like personally encountering something for the first time and that's appropriate but um but then if you know it's happened before and if you've got some sort of sense of where it's coming from and historical precedent, that's also a guiding force so that you make reasonable decisions in any political struggle, I would say. Yeah, and, and I mean, it, I, I, I always like to hear about teaching, too, because I mean, I'm thinking about, like, young people. And, you know, I, I, I think by virtue of the fact that we teach, um, you know, college-age students, and you know, you're in you're in a community college um, in New Jersey where you know mm-hmm. the people are young. They're they're what like eighteen to twenty one years old, and like that's an age that's so formative. How are you? Um, how are you talking to your students about this stuff? Are they concerned about it? I mean, I, th- I think you get different groups of students, you know, react differently to this material. But like, how how are you um, kind of negotiating this stuff in the classroom? Have they been have they been outraged, or has it been something that you've had to kind of like, I don't know, um, get them to talk about? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's a huge, there's a huge range of experience, and people come in with all different levels of knowledge and understanding. I think that's more true at community colleges than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so it's a it's a big range of response. Um, I find, for the most part, uh, where I teach in central New Jersey is a fairly conservative, politically conservative area. So um, it's not like when I was teaching at CUNY, where the CUNY kids, like if you talk about immigration or urban politics or racial profiling, like a lot of them just get it and they're like, yeah, I know, that's my experience. And you sort of go from there. Yeah. That's not necessarily the experience in where I teach at Raritan Valley Community College in central New Jersey. But there, I find for the most part, they're very open-minded and they're ready to like learn. If you teach, I try to teach in a way that um, poses questions primarily and allows them to explore these things on their own and you give them resources and just ask them question after question and you poke and you prod and Mm -hmm. you give evidence and you ask for evidence and you just facilitate their exploration of difficult issues. And they're into it for the most part, especially if they feel that they can come to their own conclusions and they can come to conflicting conclusions with their peers. Um, and sometimes they come to the same conclusions I would, and sometimes they don't, but like we, I definitely now I'm not anymore trying to, to just cover material in my history classes. I haven't been for a long time and I know, you know, probably many people don't follow that model anymore either. Um, so I just select, um, themes and they're all based on like, well, what are the main, problems of our day and what are the historical origins for then and we sometimes select the themes ourselves and then we develop models and resources to explore those themes so immigration is always a big thing Mm -hmm. and mass incarceration and race and you know war and imperialism and like (laughs) we we try to just use the historians tools and methods to 
facilitate their exploration of all these things. And, I you know, love for that. Some students it works, and others I don't think they like it so much. But that's the way it goes, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't please everyone, but I mean, it, it, it's like you know, for it, it's a student centered learning model where you're kind of like using. Um, I don't know the techniques and you know methodologies of history to kind of model kind of how to how to learn and research and investigate and how to discuss things. So yeah, you're right. I think a lot right. of people who are outside of college don't. The and I, something I like to talk about on the show is kind of stand up for the historical discipline and, and humanities work because it's mm-hmm. not just uh, you telling them about what's in the Howard Zinn book. It's something much more involved and much more engaging. Uh, and that model mm. is, uh, I don't know, I, I, hope, I hope no one's teaching history that way anymore. I, I have a feeling there are probably some people out there doing that. But, yeah, it's much more it's much more fun to actually, like, you know, I love that. Pick themes and make them work. Yeah, exactly. And if you, if your basic political orientation is like mine, you couldn't teach that way because that's an authoritarian way of teaching. Totally, yeah. It's yep. the idea that you have the authority and you're going to just sort of give this gift of, knowledge Knowledge or information and that they should be grateful to accept it. But if you're basically asking them to question all authority and to think about like, well, what's legitimate authority and what's not in terms of the classroom, the academy, our society, our families, right? Then, then you have to teach differently. And like, that wouldn't be consistent with any, anything else you're talking or thinking about. So, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I always do it as effectively as possible, but that's my basic orientation. I love that. I mean, I, I think you already answered this question, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about because it's, so we, we, it's something that you and I, I remember talking about, you know, you you and I and, and others when we would talk about politics outside of class and everything, we, we, would, we would kind of talk about our own lives and what we were going to do with them and like, what are we supposed to be doing? And one of the things that came up a lot is that, well, you know, no matter what we're doing, like our careers, it seems like are heading towards like teaching. So how do you like weld mm. that idea of, of teaching into your politics and, and into activism? Like, and, and I know people go round and round on this, but like, do you see teaching as political and as part of your kind of political project or, or as activism? Is it fold into that in some way? Are they separate? Um, or, or, or how, how does, how do you, how do you navigate those waters? So what actually, so there's lots of different levels and components of what I see as like the larger teaching or educational mission, right? Mm-hmm. So like there's the, what's happened actually in the classroom. And there, um, aside from like selecting materials and helping to shape the things that we, we examine collectively, um, I hope politics sort of formally doesn't enter, right? Like, at least in terms of, like, my political views and I'm trying to persuade people like I would in a meeting or, you know, some other political forum. Mm -hmm. Like, I would be willing to do that. But in the classroom, I'm not willing to do that. And the main main function, I think, there is just help students learn how to think critically, evaluate evidence. And that's important politically, obviously, because I think if people are able to think and critically evaluate evidence. They're better able to defend themselves Mm -hmm. and to defend each other uh, and to be in a functioning society and represent and lead and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the role of politics in the classroom. There's also the, I mean, yeah, so there's there's also the um, teaching that's outside of the classroom. And and I um, do a lot of, like, lectures at public libraries and... um, do as you as you've noted some writing not just for an academic audience for but for public consumption mm-hmm. and so there I think you know you can be a little more political in terms of your um, role as an educator yeah still yeah. not being um, dogmatic and you know you're still providing evidence and but um, there you're trying to persuade right and mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. if we're politically oriented and active we're trying to persuade because we have our certain politics and political vision in mind. And um, that's also, I think, the role of education. That's public education. It's a historian doing what she or he should be doing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. and so... I, I like that idea, that there are different like kind of venues um, that, that you deploy your historical knowledge and your, your kind of politics in different ways. Uh, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's totally appropriate. You're always so reasonable, Carl. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's my Iowa roots. Yeah. Because, you know, everyone in Iowa is very reasonable. Yeah, super reasonable place. Right. Known as the right. I- Iowa, the land of reason. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, 
Well, thanks for talking to me. Uh, you know, the, the to, to 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 just reiterate again, you know how much how influential you know those conversations with you and and Jeff Johnson and Paul Nash, uh, rest in peace. Yeah. Um, and a, a, a million other people from that from that um world that we were a part of. Uh, it, it still formed, you know, it, it, my politics in a lot of ways, but also, you know, uh, whenever I talk to you, I, it always kind of recenters me in the mission of the of what we're actually doing too. you know, it's like teaching hmm. and being in the academy and what this uh, what all this intellectual work is for. Um, hmm. So so thanks for thanks for explaining all that to me. Yeah, thanks. It was a lot of fun. And I, I too, was greatly influenced by that experience in grad school. And so and thanks for you and for this great podcast. And I've been listening since the very first episode, so keep up the great work. Cool. Thanks, Carl. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, I want to thank my guest, Carl Linskoog. I had a great time talking with Carl. I always do. It made me think of our long conversations uh, in bars and coffee shops and our apartments uh, about American history during graduate school that really kind of formed the way I see everything. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. And there's more stuff about Carl um, on this week's bonus episode, which is a retrospective of the nostalgia trap. And there's another bonus episode coming out this week uh, about immigration, talking with Justin Rogers Cooper about some of the larger, scarier trends in American history that are kind of culminating right now. We always have uh, freak out conversations with Justin Rogers Cooper. So if you're looking for a more nightmarish take on what's going on, um, check out this week's bonus episode about immigration with Justin Rogers Cooper. Um, and check out all the stuff that's on The Baffler. There's uh, always interesting stuff, and many more writers from The Baffler are going to be coming on the show talking about their work, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and again, if you can support the show at all, it would be great to keep us on the air. Uh, we are trying very hard to keep putting out episodes, and anything helps. So patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Donate to the show. You'll get access to all those bonus episodes and some of the more freakish conversations we have. Uh, but also you'll be supporting the show and keeping it going if you enjoy it. Thank you very much, and we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.